Hi, this is Mr. Heinrich with another AP Physics Classroom FRQ. We're looking at AP Physics 1, Unit 7, FRQ 1, and we have this sign that's being suspended from one of three points, A, B, or C. It's not suspended from all three at the same time. We have a mass of MS, a length of LS, and we have an angle of theta. And yeah, we can make that assumption that's 90 degrees right now, but that's the theta that they reference throughout the entire question. All right, so the first part, part A, let's see what it wants. Rank the three hook locations according to the amount of tension the support cable would experience if the students decide to support the sign from that location. Use one for the least tension and three for the greatest tension. If two locations would have the same tension, give them the same ranking. So we have those three locations, A, B, and C, and if you're looking at your FRQ, A is the one that's closest to the wall, C is furthest from the wall. So let's just look at this idea and use one of those locations in general. We have, kind of looks like this F, right? There's our pivot point. I'll write here what this is, unit seven. FRQ1 for AP1. Okay, so we have this pivot here, and let's say we're looking at the furthest one out, the C attachment, the C attachment right there. And let's think about what's happening. Well, it's not moving. That's what's happening, right? So we have an MG here, MSG. Mass times G is our force of gravity, right? And we have also a tension upward in this string tension. And I'm not drawing these to their relative magnitudes with respect to each other. I'm just getting the idea down. We have a tension right there. Now, we know that this length is LS and that this, this length right here is probably LS divided by 2 and that this is some length. Now they're not specifying from the pivot position to point C or point B or point A how long that is, how much of LS that is, but we can at least understand that there is a static situation here, right? This thing is in equilibrium. Now there are two conditions for equilibrium. Before we make it to the rotation unit, we say that the net force is equal to zero. That's the first condition for equilibrium. That means up equals down, left equals right, but when you get to the rotation unit, we also have this condition that torques counterclockwise must equal torques clockwise, right? If this is our pivot, this MG would try to produce a clockwise torque, whereas this tension would try to produce a counterclockwise torque, right? So as I am deciding which location has the greatest tension, a, B, or C, or do they all have the same? I need to think about this idea of equilibrium, right? If this string and B and C were not attached, if this string was what was supporting this arm, wouldn't that tension have to work? Work is the wrong word here. Wouldn't that tension have to be a lot bigger because of that shorter lever arm? Remember what torque is. It's a force that is perpendicular to a lever arm, right? That force times that R perpendicular is what I call it. You'd have to have a much bigger tension because of that short little lever arm. Here at B, you'd have a slightly lesser tension because you have a longer lever arm. And C, you would have the least amount of tension because you have this really long lever arm. And that T times that R, that T times that R, that T times that R, all of those would come out to be the same exact counterclockwise torques. So I'm going to say at position A, B, C, A has the greatest tension, the next greatest, and the smallest tension, right? So back to my statement to justify this answer, which they ask for, tension is greatest at point A. At any of the three locations, What's the same? The torque is the same, right? The torque, 
and I'll put here counterclockwise. The torque counterclockwise is the same because now let's not take the time to say big tension times small r or medium tension times medium r. Let's not do that because why? Because they're all offsetting each one of these. Whatever one I have hooked up is offsetting the torque of gravity, right? This gravitational force times that radial arm right there. So at any of the three locations, the torque counterclockwise is the same because it is balancing, you could say, right? Balancing the torque of gravity clockwise. Then we would say since, let's keep talking about position A, right? That's how I started off this argument. Since torque counterclockwise, I'm going to say is equal to, let's go ahead and call it tension, right? Tension times R. And the radius for point A is smallest or least you could say, right? Then tension T must be greatest to produce the necessary I could say maybe counterclockwise torque here. And that should do it. Okay, let's go on to part B1. B1 is next. Now B1 is a little tricky. In fact, this whole FRQ from this point forward, I think is kind of a tricky FRQ. So if we're looking at B1, let's get to it. We have these three locations. Now I'm gonna draw those three locations while you're looking at it on your screen and the students hang the sign with a cable, but the cable breaks. The sign rotates clockwise. The diagram below shows the sign at three different times as it is rotating. And so we have there, there, or there, it looks like. Okay. So these are my three locations. There's my pivot point. This is T1. At T1, it is pivoted this far. At T2, it is pivoted this far. At T3, it is pivoted this far. And what this question is asking us is that any one of those times is the angular acceleration greater, smaller. So I'll, I'll read it to you. Indicate at which time, if any, the angular acceleration of the sign is greatest or whether it is the same at all three times. And so we need to decide, is it the same at all three positions? Let me zero in on each one of these individually. Let's look at this one first. What is the force that's causing it to spin? The force that's producing a torque. I'm gonna to even exaggerate this force of gravity a lot more. It is the force of gravity, right? MSG. And this is that length that is half of LS, right? Now, if this is my pivot point right here, does this force times that radius produce the torque? The answer is not quite. It's a component of MSG that is actually perpendicular to this radial arm, right? And so I'm gonna draw my components like this, because we can, right? Now remember, this component right here is actually acting at that point of contact of the force, right? So it's not really over here, even though I drew it over here for my trigonometry, this component is actually here. So picture it being right there, right? But the reason I drew it over here is because we know, if you recall, that that is angle theta. Can you see now that this is also the same angle theta? 
if you reference the first drawing, this is where they place theta, right? So what is this component? It would be, I'm going to drop the S because that's just more stuff than we need to write, mg sine theta. So my question is, before I go to position 2 and position 3 at time 2 and time 3, the question is, does this mg sine theta stay consistent? Now you might be asking yourself, well, what does that have to do with angular acceleration? Well, isn't it, isn't it a net torque that causes an object that's spinning, which has a rotational inertia, to angularly accelerate, right? And what is that torque equivalent to in this situation? Well, the force here is mg sine theta, right, times that radius, I'll just call it r. I know it's half of ls, but let's just call it r for right now and make things simple. And that would equal i alpha, which kind of gets into the next part, but we'll get there when we get there. So now looking at this, does the i change? Does this thing's mass distribution, the thing that's spinning, does its rotational inertia change? No, it does not. Does the r change? Does the attachment point where mg is acting change? No, it doesn't. So then we zero in on this idea of mg sine theta and alpha. Does mg sine theta change? And if it does, well, then alpha changes. Does that make sense? These two are constant no matter what location I'm looking at. You can reason that out with yourself there, okay? So let's look at the next position, and some of you have already figured out which alpha is greatest because they're not all the same. So here we're going to draw our, our bar the same exact length, right? And it's some smaller angle theta than it was here. Remember, this is T1, and now we're at T2. And we'll stop after T2. Here's our mg. Now that mg has the same exact length, right? And let's draw its components. So we have one here and one here. But remember, this component is actually acting right there, right? At the point of contact of the force. But we draw it here because, yeah, I can see, oh, yep, this theta is equal to that theta. Now this, again, would be mg sine theta. And you tell me, isn't that smaller than it was here? Yeah, and you can imagine if we actually took the time to draw T3, it's really exaggerated. The, the, the X component, so to speak, is really exaggerated, and that mg sine theta component will be so tiny. So mg sine theta, the force that is responsible when you multiply it by R to be the torque net, is decreasing. So where is mg sine theta greatest? At T1. So I would make sure to say, and they have all these blanks here for like T1, T2, and T3, or they're all the same, right? I would definitely choose T1. And then you'd provide a physical explanation for your ranking. Now to save time, I'm going to read you the one that I wrote. And it's, I mean, it's already what I've said, but let's tidy it up, right? At time T1, the component of gravity, mg sine theta, is greatest. And mg sine theta times the radius or times the lever arm is the force, excuse me, mg sine theta times the lever arm is the torque that is causing the sine to have angular acceleration. Since it is largest at T1, angular acceleration would be largest at T1. And then you could go on to say, mg sine theta decreases as the sine spins to position T2 and position T3. Okay, play that back, write that down. That's how I would prove it. All right, let's go on. That was B1. B1. Let's go on to B2. This is a very involved FRQ. B2. But all the parts from this point forward are kind of informed by what we just talked about. So they say show that alpha 
can be modeled with this equation, 3g sine theta divided by 2 ls. And they say, hey, you need to know the rotational inertia. I'll tell you what it is. Is, the rotational inertia of the sine is 1 third m s l s squared. So basically, let's get to this using Newton's second law uh, for rotational objects, right? Or for rotational situations, which we just discussed. It's torque net equals I alpha. And we're going to plug in this idea of what torque net is in this situation. Just got done talking about it a lot, so I'm just going to write mg sine theta. We better put the s back there to be specific. Mass of the sine, right? Times. Now, I didn't bother calling it specifically what it is. This force is acting at a length ls divided by 2, right? The force of gravity is acting at the center of mass of that sign, and the center of mass is at a length ls divided by 2. Now that is a force times a lever arm, that's what torque is, that would be equal to I. Now what's I? They gave that to us. One third ms ls squared alpha. Now we just have to solve this thing for alpha. And I think we have all of the building blocks here to get the right answer. So what happens? Our MSs cancel out. One of these LSs cancels out with that squared. And I'm going to multiply 3 over, right? And I'm going to divide by LS. And so I would get, let's flip this thing around. Multiplying 3 to the top, I'd have a 3 times a G sine theta. All divided by. There's still a 2 down there, right? 2 LS, because we have to divide the LS over the LS that remained because this was LS squared. And that's exactly the expression they wanted us to get to. So B2 is all done. That was nice and fast. Let's go to C. Let's see what C says. The students want to describe the angular velocity omega of the sine as it rotates and they propose the following equation so I'm going to write that equation real quick here. They propose that omega, again that's angular velocity, right, as a function of time, is equal to 3g sine theta divided by 2ls times t. Now I'm going to admit when I first looked at this, I got it wrong. They're asking us, if you go on to read, regardless of whether or not this equation right here that I just wrote down is correct, does this equation make physical sense? And when I first looked at this, I said, well, as time increases, it's speeding up in its, in its swing, right? As it swings down, its angular velocity is speeding up. So yeah, as this increases, angular velocity would increase, duh. And I write a quick little thing and we're done. However, it's not quite that straightforward because what is this actually saying to us? It's saying that this angular velocity would increase proportionally with time. And that's just not the case. Think back to what I was talking about. As the thing swings from position where time is one, time two, and time three, wasn't mg sine theta getting less and less and less? Therefore, the accelerating torque, the angularly ex angular acceleration caused by that torque was getting less and less and less, right? I hope you're tracking with me. So then if my rate at which I'm angularly accelerating is getting less because my torque is getting less, then yeah, this is increasing. It's just not increasing at a constant rate. It's increasing, but the increase is tapering off. The rate at which this increases decreases, which is a very confusing way to say it, but that's exactly right. The rate at which omega increases decreases. All right, so all of that said, let's see, I think I have it written down here, and I'm just going to show it to you, and you're going to pause the screen. This is what I wrote. Let's make sure that we get that all queued up for you. I'll even raise it up. Hey, there you go. You can pause the screen, and I think that will make a lot of sense. That is the formal way to say what I just said. Okay, let's go on to part D. Part D is finally the last part of this FRQ.
And part D proposes this graph. In fact, it's not just a, a proposed thing. The students actually got this graph when they tracked angular velocity. Let me zoom in again. When they tracked angular velocity versus theta, they got this graph with sensors. And what the question is asking us, so it's kind of like the negative x squared, like y equals negative x squared type of graph. Um, but let's, let's uh, step back from that statement and let's look at what they're saying here. Four students independently derive equations and propose them to describe the motion of the sign. Which equation best matches the data collected? And it gives us all these equations. Now we've been using the sine equation over and over again. We're having that mg sine theta, so that's very tempting to do here. But I want you to look back at this information with me. And I want to look at this graph kind of in reverse. Because if you remember when that sine at t equals zero, when that sine has not swung out yet, it's at what angle? 90 degrees, right? So let's that was our starting point, so it's almost better in this case to go backwards as we read the graph. So what happened here? We released it, and right away, for these five degrees, we got a huge increase in what? Angular velocity, right? In our omega. And then in the next, look at this, and we had two radians per second of increase for that first five degrees of swing. Now, for another 20 degrees of swing, we got another 2 radians per second. But check that out. It took another 20 degrees. It only took 5 degrees to get 2 radians per second. But then it took another 20 degrees to get another 2 radian per second increase. And you can see we don't get another 2 radian per second increase. Even when we get to 0 degrees, we only get a 1.5 radian per second increase. So that is to say that it's what we said earlier, right? that as this thing swings further and further, it's not speeding up angularly as quickly, meaning its alpha is not constant. It's reducing. Its angular acceleration is reducing. So we got to think about what cosine and sine are all about. And this takes some familiarity with these functions, right? You can think of your unit circle if you want to. I think that's the easiest. When you're at zero degrees, right? When you're at a zero degree mark, your cosine is biggest, right? But when you're at zero degrees, sine is smallest. Sine is actually uh, zero. The sine of zero is in fact zero, but the cosine of zero is in fact one. So when we start off, we have a pretty big angle, right? 90 degrees. So if we put in the sine of 90 right here, right? We'd get a big answer and we get an omega that was a certain amount. Is there any angular velocity at the very beginning when we release this thing at 90 degrees? No, the sine of 90 gives us one. And again, if we had one here, we would get some value for this expression and we'd have a beginning angular velocity at time equals zero, which doesn't make sense. You track in with me? So that means we have to look at one of our cosine functions instead, right? Now, which one of those is it? Which one do you think it is? Well, if you've been looking at the uh, expression we found in part C, I think it would, no, part B2, it placed G up here, right? And that makes sense because you've got to look at your units, right? G over L over, excuse me, G over LS would be meters per second squared over meters. And if you figured out all those units, you would end up with radians per second. So this one makes sense because of that G over LS. So that's the first thing I'm gonna say. I'm gonna come right out the gates and say, the first equation check, omega as a function of theta equals square root three G cosine theta all over LS. That's the correct one. Is correct because G root G over LS would produce, and you can prove that out on your own, 
let's not waste our time with it, would produce radians per second, which is the output, right? The output is omega angular velocity, which is measured in radians per second. Okay, now that in and of itself works for the unit, but that could have worked for the other one with the sine function. So now we do need to talk a little bit about that angle. So here's what I'm going to say. As theta decreases, again, we're kind of looking at this graph from right to left in the graph. So I'm talking about the graph, right? Omega increases, shorthanding omega there, omega increases, yet its increase I don't want to say decreases because that's very confusing. So I'll say, yet its increase tapers off. It's again what I was talking about in the last part, part C, tapers off. This is mirrored in the equation, the equation up here, right? This equation, because as theta decreases, and it does decrease from 90 degrees to smaller and smaller degrees, what happens to the cosine of theta? Cosine of theta actually increases. That's how the function works. As your angle gets smaller, your cosine of theta gets bigger. Then say, however, the increase in omega that cosine of theta produces tapers off, same language we used up earlier, tapers off because the cosine theta is being rooted. Now that is a done and done answer. Thank you. Please subscribe. Have a great day. Talk to you soon.